The American pronghorn, what most Americans call antelope, are by far the fastest land animal in the West, reaching speeds of up to 60 miles an hour. Although I'm not nearly as fast as them, we both call the wide open plains of the American West home. Vast prairies, plateaus, and buttes set amongst the backdrop of towering snowy peaks. On this episode of Meat Eater Hunts, my brother-in-law and I are hunting antelope outside of Big Timber, Montana. And turns out, after scouting it for the last month off and on, that uh, there's very uh, little public land in this unit, and there's also very few antelope in general in this unit. Luckily, I know one landowner, Jeff Walton, he's actually my buddy Cal's uncle, and he's got access in the unit to roughly a thousand acres. So all of our antelope eggs are in a thousand acre baskets. Now he's seen the antelope here in the last like, I don't know, a couple, three days. Um, I think two, three days ago he was up here and saw some. So we're crossing our fingers. Cameron and I both have uh, buck tags and doe tags. I'm hoping to help put Cameron onto his first pronghorn. And what I've realized is that they, they don't like the same kind of terrain like deer and elk do, where there's more cover, more you know undulations in the terrain, a lot of trees. They prefer wide open spaces. So we're gonna drive up kind of out of this little canyony draw type country and we're gonna come up onto a plateau and a bunch of sagebrush and grass and that's where I expect to see it. Fingers crossed. Yeah. I think let's just like pull in over here. We'll just kind of hide the truck over here. One of the reasons pronghorn love these wide open spaces is their incredible vision. Meriwether Lewis was especially struck by their eyes, making note of the size and the deep green shade of their pupils. These eyes enable pronghorn to spot predators from over five kilometers away, and by raising the hairs on their rump and making a snorting noise, they're able to alert the entire herd of danger. Coupled with the fact that they travel in large bands, concealment is going to be a huge factor for Cameron and I. And with only a thousand acres at our disposal, we may only get one crack at it. Now you have uh, ammo in that cheek pouch. Yeah, there's five in here. You want any more than that? It's up to you how, how confident you are in your shooting. Hopefully I can get it done in five. I'm gonna probably carry a few more than five myself. <laughs> You never know. It always sucks to have to run back to the truck if uh, something goes awry. Then I'll take a few more. Here. You can see Cameron's putting on knee pads. I've got them built in to these pants here. If there's two pieces of crucial gear for antelope hunting, I would think it's a bipod and knee pads. Because like you're gonna take a long shot. You get lucky now and then, you get a 100 yard shot, but like, if I had to guess, the average shot's gonna be 300. I'm not gonna personally shoot any farther than that, really. No, I'm not either. I just don't like to. It's a small target. The antelope is just not a giant animal. They like weigh like 100 pounds for a mature buck. Your kill zone, your vitals are like, you know, not even quite a foot square. Anywho, all right, let's get to going. Yeah, man. Cameron and I met while working in a kitchen when I was 19. At the time, he was courting his wife. A few years later, they married and introduced me to the younger sister, who's now my wife. In essence, I turned my best hunting buddy into my brother-in-law. He and I fished or hunted almost every day back then. His fire stoked my passion for the outdoors and led me to become a guide. Cameron became a professional chef and moved away, but our lives always came back together be it the outdoors or on family vacations. What's nice about hunting with him is that I don't feel like I'm guiding, just hunting with a buddy, which is a relaxing change of pace. 
it's deceiving. On the map, it just looks like a pancake. When you get out here, you see there's just little rolls here and there. And the antelope, you know, like I said, it's a 100 pound animal, so they only stand yay tall. So they can be just in one little crease. And if you're not paying attention, you're walking along and you get, you walk up on a little bit of a knoll and all of a sudden you're skyline to some antelope that you didn't see. And they're blown out of there and it's over. And uh, we really can't afford that since we only have about a thousand acres to work with. So we're just going to take our time and just ease along this timbered edge here. And that way if we see something we can drop off the edge and use it for cover to make a stalk. With a limited amount of country to hunt, we're having to employ both a spot and stalk and an ambush strategy. If we just keep walking, we'll have the entire area hunted out in just a few hours. So instead, we'll find a good vantage, sit down, and hope they come to us. Unlike deer or elk that are active early and late, pronghorn can be found on their feet at all times of the day. There's some just right on the neighbors. We have one fence separating us from having a shot. They're within range. You can see them just over the top of the rise here. See that one juniper? Yeah. Look to the left of them. There's two bedded. Oh, yeah. There's more down to the right. There's an old trick. I've never even tried it for antelope. But I've heard, I've, I tried it on a caribou and it kind of worked. But antelope tend to be pretty curious. They say you can like wear a white t-shirt or wave a white flag and you'll get their attention as long as they'll come check you out. Three out of the four are looking to your left. The flag didn't work, but it looks like they might graze their way north off of the neighbor's property and onto the property we're hunting. We'll sit back, keep an eye on them, and see what happens. The segmentation of land that we're struggling with as hunters is a far more serious challenge for these pronghorn, whose existence depends on their ability to migrate across this vast sagebrush steppe. They've been able to outlive the American cheetah, dire wolves, and the giant short-faced bear. But fragmentation caused by roads, cities, and industry have turned this ecosystem into pieces of what it once was creating a bigger problem than apex predators ever were. It's 2.30 now. We first saw these antelope at 11.30. So we've been sitting on them three hours. And uh, I'm kind of surprised how much time they spent bedded. Last week we were chasing antelope in Wyoming and they kind of just tended to be up on their feet a lot more. But uh, this fence that we're sitting on right here, they're, like, they're about 200 yards that side of it and we need them to cross the fence and go that way. Um, we've got about 300 yards that direction till we can't go either. So we're definitely kind of at a corner and we're crossing our fingers. But again, we have a thousand acres to work with and you know, this is about the best thing we got going. So hopefully they come north, hop the fence. We'll be waiting for them. I think we gave these guys a good effort, but it just doesn't seem like it's gonna happen. Where did those jokers come from? Dang it, I was just getting ready to stop and glass the horizon. I took too many steps. And he's out. Oh, that burns. Just gotta go slower and look more. What'd you think of your first day of uh, antelope hunting there, Cameron? <laughs> oh, uh, it's pretty exciting. Was it? Yeah. 
Yeah, never been on an antelope hunt before, so super stoked. Even though all the, really all the ones we saw were on the wrong side of the fence? Well, yeah, when you consider that those were out of here at Mach 5 from like a quarter of a mile away, it, it's, I feel privileged that we got to sit there for three hours and watch those guys at 300 yards. Yeah. Like 30. So, yeah, it's everything I thought it would be. It's not very easy. I got a lot of respect for those that have tagged one. Well, there's easier and harder antelope hunts than this one. We're definitely limited because we have only so much land to hunt, but I think I'm going to use my Onyx and try to make a phone call to that landowner. Beside us. Yeah, and see if we can get access to that. Because if I was a bet man, I'd throw down a hundred right now and say they're going to be right in that hole at daylight. I hope so. And if not daylight, by 10 a.m., I'd get, put 200 down. Nice. Yeah, I'm confident. I like a little wager. So we'll just have to see and see if they're uh, if we can get at permission or not. Um, right on. Make some phone calls and see what's up. Yeah, it's fun though. It's a good time. Yeah. All right, let's go get a cold beer. Yeah. Day two of our hunt, and it's windy as all get out. We park just below the crest of the hill in case the pronghorn are in the meadow just above us where we spooked them last night. The wind is good and bad for hunting. The swaying trees and bushes conceal our movement, but the wind eliminates any chance at a longer shot. They're all right there. Same spot. I think that we can go like up high and come around and there was like one big juniper that was kind of on this edge and we might be within range from there. The antelope are, are in the same spot where we watched them yesterday and we, we gained permission to hunt the other side of the fence. And uh, so now it's just a matter of figuring out the stalk. And, uh, oh, did you see that? Oh, there's animals going into that draw to the left. Here, let's get behind this juniper real quick. the game plan here well I think the best we can do is just do what we just did is back off the edge do another circle and then just come in right on top of them okay. be belly crawl to that edge and hopefully the grass will be low enough where we can like you know see and shoot before we're fully exposed you know okay there's zero cover over there I mean it's just grass so an invaluable skill for hunting out west is using the close horizon to your advantage. I'm constantly scanning the landscape, paying close attention to the horizon right in front of me, always expecting to see the ears, horns, or top of a pronghorn's back. Taking just a couple of steps can reveal lots of terrain, so it's crucial to go slow. After spotting an animal, you can back off from the edge and walk freely, knowing that the horizon line is keeping you hidden. Now that we're at the edge, we're going to make a slow approach on our hands and knees to get into shooting position. Like I said, knee pads are key. You got a clear shot yet? Not quite. I'm gonna probably slide up about 10 feet or so. Yeah, you get set up first, and if they haven't spooked when you're set up, then I'll sneak in and get set up too for a follow-up shot. Can you see that doe that's standing right now? Yep. She's quartering away from us. 
There's one to the left that actually looks like it's looking at us, so be still for a second. Yep, I see her. There's a buck in the center of that group that's uh, facing away from us. Yeah, I see the one that's bedded facing right. Yep. All right, I think that the buck just stood up, didn't he? Yep, yep, I'm gonna take him. Hit him again. He's down. He's down. Holy man. Nice, dude. <laughs> yeah, dude. First antelope. Look at that guy. And it's a buck. That's what I'm talking about right there. Yeah, man. Holy crap. Hey, just double checking, but your chamber's empty? It is. Dude, what's crazy is we thought they were bedded out of the wind. He's not even kind of out of the wind. No, they were all laying right in it. Those are crazy looking critters, man. Aren't they? Yeah, check out this mohawk he's got. That's the beauty of the antelope. It doesn't matter which one you shoot, they all are tender vittles. That is just freaking cool, man. Yeah. Yeah, so these are called uh, cutters on a prong horn, and then these are the prongs, the curve. We gut and load up Cameron's prong horn and head down to the ranch manager, Jeff Walton's place. It only seems fair to share our experience with the person who made it possible in the first place. You remember the very first time you gave me a tour around this place? Yep. I think you were showing me around because we were going to come shoot something with yep. Cal, actually. Yep. Yep. And uh, we weren't planning on hunting antelope or whatever, but you told me that every year you like to get an antelope tag and that you like to kill an antelope. And I was, I was saying, man, that's really quite odd because I've, usually when you talk to beef and uh, sheep ranchers, it's kind of like, nah, the game's off the table. We eat beef around here. But what is it about antelope, you think, that well, you like so much? Uh, antelope, it's so fun to hunt them because of the stock and everything, you know, and, and if you can get them before they even move, you know, and shoot them on the spot and skin them, gut them and skin them, and then bring them home and hang them for a while. Uh, these antelope up here are some of the tastiest antelope I've ever had. There's no wild game to them, and, and I like to stir fry them and, uh, or just pan fry them with a little salt, pepper, and garlic powder, and and then maybe a choke cherry reduction sauce in there and oh my god they're heavenly how would you describe the flavor of an antelope it's hard to describe because it's it's so good you just you're just amazed at how tasty it is and uh, our kids grew up on uh, venison elk and antelope yeah and they didn't know any difference you know we have steaks every once in a while and stuff but I mean, I'm a beef producer, but I sell, send all my beef away. <laughs> you were telling me also when we were driving around that you really like to like pick out a certain one. You just don't shoot the first buck that crosses no. your path. No, no, because all summer long, we're up there checking our cows and stuff, and and you you figure out who's going where and who's doing what, and you just put the sneak on and and get the one you want. So. Well, thanks again for yeah. letting us on. Cameron, Cameron had a yeah. Yeah. great, great first antelope hunt. I'm glad you liked it. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so it's the day after Cameron shot his first antelope. We're at my house now, and we're gonna fix up a little antelope. The recipe we're gonna do is it's gonna be a real basic pan seared, oven finished roast. Uh, I'm gonna use a top round. And then to spruce it up, Cameron's going to do a sauce. And I thought that'd be a good like trade. I helped Cameron get his first antelope and then Cameron would help me and you guys 
spruce up your next uh, venison roast. One point I wanna make is that we're actually not using the top round off of Cameron's antelope from yesterday. Reason being is that we're still in the 24 hour rigor mortis period. And so if we were to take a cut off of his antelope, it's still got rigor mortis in it. And even though it might feel soft and wiggly, um, once you cook it, the muscles are gonna contract even more and it's gonna be a tough piece of meat, very chewy. So it's always best to at least give your animal 24 hours. Um, and on another note, another tip is if you can, leave it on the bone. When the muscles are attached to the bone with the tendons, when rigor mortis leaves the muscles, they're basically being stretched back out to their original form. So leave it on the bone for at least 24 hours, then debone. I know sometimes if you're in the back country, you can't do it. You just gotta cut it off the bone to save weight and get out of the woods. What's the basic idea behind this sauce? Um, I just wanted to come up with something that was tart with quite a bit of acid. I think for antelope, it would, it, it'll do a, a fine job on that end. It would do really well with duck. I think it'd do really well with pheasant. Um, so we're just gonna give it a try. It's a super easy sauce, really, really easy. And I think it, it's dressed to impress. Perfect, so. that's what we like. Yeah. All right, let's get to it. Juice a couple blood oranges, combine in a large pot with extra virgin olive oil, cranberry juice, thyme, beef stock, scallion, juniper berries, and brown sugar. Whisk it all together, bring it to a boil, then turn it down to a simmer. I'm looking for an even consistency of bubbles across the top of it when I'm reducing. All right, so while your sauce is reducing. Oh yeah. I think we can fire the roast. So we've preheated the oven to 375. Right now I'm heating up a cast iron skillet. I'm gonna get it pretty darn hot and I might put in just a teaspoon of avocado oil in there just so it doesn't stick. I'm just gonna sear all four sides, maybe even stick it on its end when it's nice and brown. I'm then gonna take it and take the whole pan and stick it into the oven. I'm gonna start with 10 minutes on the timer. That's 10 minutes. And then, if you don't have one of these at home, get one. So at 10 minutes, I'll pull it out of the oven, stick this thermometer in it, and I'm looking to hit about 125, which is a little bit on the rare side, but what's gonna happen when you pull it out, it's gonna to continue to cook, but you just let it sit for five or 10 minutes, then slice it, and it's gonna come into more of that medium rare temperature and look. After the sauce is reduced for about 30 minutes, add some orange zest and cook for a couple more minutes. Strain, then add dried cherries, plums, and salt and pepper to taste. And then what I wanna do is I'm looking at the consistency of that. You can see how it has thickened. Yeah, the way that I'm it's looking. Getting, it's getting almost syrupy. So, so now, I'm gonna dip that spoon in there, and that's kind of what I'm looking for. I'd say that that coated the back of the spoon. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not running off of the spoon, right? Yeah. That's kind of the consistency that I'm looking for. That's the right amount of acid and the right amount of sugar. Let the sauce cool slightly, then mix in a quarter cup of butter to add fat and texture. Spoon a healthy amount of sauce onto the plate, lay the sliced meat on top, and garnish with green onions. It's a rich sauce. I mean, as easy as it is, and as quickly as you can prepare it, it's got some weight to it. Yeah, I definitely overcooked the meat a little bit, but I think that's one of the beauties of antelope. It's uh, even at medium, it's still tender. Mm -hmm. It is delicious. Super fun hunt. I'm kind of glad it didn't happen on the first day for you. Um, that would have been too easy. Just yeah. like when my dad shot his moose on the second day, we were like, dude. Yeah, he got a little too soon. Yeah, you yeah. didn't get the full experience, <laughs> you know, wondering if you're gonna get one. Yeah. Um, we had to battle some wind. Yeah. Had to get close for that shot, man. I, I, I prefer a challenge, and the wind certainly was that, so. Yeah, man, a lot of fun. That sauce is super good. I can't wait to try it again. Thank you. Um, and uh, your antelope 
we'll be eating here in a few days. So yeah, call we'll try me. Try it on that guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, call me over. Absolutely. We'll bring the kids down. Just as much as I love learning a new hunting technique, I enjoy learning a new way to cook my game. It makes Cameron the perfect hunting partner, solid in the field and in the kitchen.